What are you doing, Bear? What are you doing? Sweet Maya's having his morning coffee after milking. Jim and Bay. Oh, I forgot. Puppy did this Yeah. <laughs> Y'all, we realized like a couple months ago that how long have we been together, Jeremiah? Like 13 years, 12 years, something like that? Yeah. That we'd never shook hands the whole time. We were discussing how different people shake hands. Okay. Now, obviously, I am a woman and I am a farm girl. And so when I shake people's hands, I like shake their hand. I don't like, I don't do this. I, I like actually shake their hand. But as I have noticed since moving to the South, that many men specifically, when shaking a woman's hand, they don't actually shake their hand. They just kind of touch their hand. And so we were talking about that. And so Jeremiah and I shook hands, like kind of in conversation. I was like, I think that's the first time that we've ever shook hands. So we're making up for lost time. And right now I am putting together some sourdough starter. Now I have an active sourdough starter that a viewer sent me and has done amazing. But my friend Jill sent me this. This is her starter, Otis. I'm gonna put it together and just start it um, and, and make some stuff with my friend's starter because I think that's kind of cool. She sent me the PDF on how to reconstitute this, which is really simple. And I love the community around sourdough. I love the sharing of it and all of that. And I also love the sustainability of sourdough. I mentioned this recently. I did a video about five things you can do for food sustainability. And one of them was cooking from staples like flour and then like dried beans, rice, all of that. Uh, the thing with flour is that you need some sort of leaven unless you're just making flatbreads. I know that whenever everything happened with COVID, yeast was actually one of the first things that sold out in stores. And I've always kept yeast in, yeast in my freezer, but like we've been doing a lot of pizza dough and stuff. And I'm like, man, you really go through this if you're, you're gonna be doing a lot of baking. And it has caused me to lean more heavily into sourdough because it's just more sustainable because when you get a good starter going, it's just very easy to maintain and multiply. Now, Jill has put together a sourdough class. Um, so it's a course that's full of lots of information, like the really basic stuff about like how to work with a starter, how to keep it going, recipes, and then lots of things like what if I let my starter go and like just different things that people run into. It's the questions I get asked all the time. Now I haven't done a whole lot of sourdough content because it's all very new to me. Just a handful of months ago, I was really struggling to like get a starter going and maintain it. Now, once you get into it, you'll find it's actually very simple. I was really excited that she and her friend Sean put this course together because it's going to help a lot of people feel more confident to get into the groove and to do sourdough. So I'm gonna put a link to her course and um, they're selling the starters, Otis is what they called it, uh, where you can buy them dehydrated and you can buy the course and get started in sourdough. And I really think that it's a good thing to do regarding sustainability and just real foods. So we're really loving our sourdough journey. So I wanted to give you guys this resource for yours. So the link to the course where you can purchase that and that sourdough starter will be in the description below. So Maya and I have been doing the divide and conquer thing a little bit on the mornings as we kind of come into what will be our spring and summer routine. If it gets hotter outside, you wanna get outside a lot earlier. So by summer, once the kids are done with school, I'll actually be getting outside like 6.30 or so at first light so I can get all my garden stuff done before it's hot. Good morning, little mama. Hey, here's those babies. Here's those babies. Well, it's already starting to warm up a lot. And so what we've been doing, which is a little different, is we've actually been, uh, Maya's been coming out and milking while I get the kids ready for school and take them to school. And that way we're done with those chores early. And then we can have like coffee together and then launch into whatever else we have for the day. Hold on, I'm gonna go get you some food. This is how goats are different than cows. Do you see this? You know, my cows, if you just shut the gate and they just see that it's shut, doesn't have to be locked. They won't mess with it. Goats are gonna push it and try it 
even if it is locked, they'll just push harder. So this morning, uh, the milking's already done, got done early. And what we're doing is just bumping up the evening milking so we can milk earlier in the morning. So we milk in the evening at like five and then in the morning at seven. All right, so we're just gonna get a little bit of feed. Goats eat significantly less than cows. That's about two cups, probably a cup and a half. For goats, if you're feeding them grain uh, during milk production, maybe like a pound a day of some sort of like dairy ration is fine. With Miriam, I'm breaking hers up right now because I'm giving her food to make sure she's standing and letting these kids eat. So, that down. All right, there we go. Little babies get up in there. You wanna go against this wall? She's still been just a little steppy. She hasn't been just super gracious to them. You know, some mamas are real patient. She's not being super patient, but if she has something to eat and I can put my hand on her, the babies are getting to eat. You gotta be more persistent. Get in there. Get in there. There you go. They get kind of <laughs> here we go. Right here. Right here. Get up in there. Come on. Come on. Let's get it latched on. Come on. Right there. There we go. Both latched. The thing with newborn goats is they're so wobbly and clumsy for like the first maybe 48 hours. But if we can get them strong enough and coordinated enough just in the first few days of me doing this, um, she won't really have the option to knock them off. I mean, once they're strong enough and used to it, sh sh they will, they'll eat because they'll just harass her until she lets them. But when they're brand new, they're timid and they're uncoordinated and she's not willing to stand for them, they won't get to eat. What will happen is, is they'll just decline over the course of a couple days. So. Um, I've been doing this. I did it last night, just again after they were born, late at night I came out here, and then this morning, and I'll do this just at least a few times a day to make sure that they're getting to eat until they're strong enough, and then, you know, I'll feed her in the morning and the evening, and they'll, they'll get to eat plenty in between. As you can see, their coordination at this point still leaves a lot to be desired. Nope, it's not there. Good job, Mama. You're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. You'll be able to watch when you have little baby goats. They'll look really sunken in, even if they just haven't eaten for a few hours and then their sides start poking out right after eating. They're still probably just getting colostrum at this point. But her milk will come in pretty good today or tomorrow. All right, I've seen what I need to see here. They are sufficiently fed. Anything at this point else is just bonus. All right, good job, Miriam. So Miriam, if you haven't been following along, has historically rejected her kits. And last year she cleaned them, but she wouldn't feed them. Just no matter how hard I tried, she just donkey kicked every time they would try to latch on. And now for the first time ever in four kittings, she, uh, she is taking care of her kids with some encouragement from us. I've had a few people ask me, well, if you have a goat, that doesn't care for their kids, why would you continue to breed them? And you know, if you don't mind having bottle babies, it's not that big a deal. She milks like a gallon a day. She's like a great milker. And so it just comes down to goals. If you're really wanting a very hands-off herd and kid sharing is super important to you, which in the homesteading world, that's very um, celebrated. But for a lot of people, that doesn't matter. Um, for people who do commercial dairy, for people who show goats, um, anybody in like the more, I guess, 
I don't like calling it like the traditional agriculture, more like the commercial agriculture world. Like the idea of kid sharing or calf sharing is like, why would you do that? Like it's just par for the course to take calves and kids away from their moms as soon as they're born. So any sort of mothering instincts doesn't really matter. No, I'm a homesteader. I would like to have the freedom that kid sharing, calf sharing gives. I didn't always know that though. There was one year because the one of the people who was mentoring me and goats was into showing and I was just told, oh, you take the kids when they're born, you bottle feed them because she pasteurized all the milk. So different goals obviously are going to lead to styles of doing things in that. I have found that my preference is good mothers, but Miriam was one of my first goats. She's a beautiful goat. She's a fantastic milker. She has a great temperament. She just hasn't been a good mom, but I've continued to breed her because I didn't want to get rid of her. I did get rid of all my other goats that were bad moms because I didn't want to have a lot of that, but I was willing to kind of let it pass with her. The fact that she's raising her kids is a really big deal to me. Miriam is actually going to be going to another home. A friend of mine has a daughter who kind of coming to that point where she's ready for some responsibility and she really, really wanted some dairy goats. And I thought it would be a really good opportunity for some of my precious girls that are great milkers and good pets um, to have a home where they're more used because my plan has been to just kind of let my goats be more self-sufficient and go out in the woods and eat brush. So. Uh, the fact that she's caring for her kids is really good because I think she'll be better for them also. And I think that it's just better all around. So it's the next day. Um, right now is such a weird thing. We've never done this before. I'm kind of balancing between being a homesteader and being a mom to five kids who are playing sports. So um, that's taking a lot of time, which is fine. It's great, it's good for them. It's good for us yesterday. I ended that video and went about my busy day. So today is turning out to be beautiful. It is currently 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius in the balmy Midlands of South Carolina. Nestle is in early labor. She's in the field. I've just left her out there alone because um, again, just kind of like the other day with Mayhem, I didn't feel like it was necessary to isolate her. We're all sitting here. It's beautiful outside. She's isolated herself over under a tree and I'm just keeping an eye on her. I can see if there's an issue. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you this. I'm gonna keep a little bit of distance because I'm not wearing any protective gear. Noah's wearing protective gear. Hey Noah. We're gonna switch to voiceover mode here because I didn't wanna make poor Noah turn his music off and I don't wanna get hit with any sort of copyright infringement. But as you can see, we've moved on the stage of painting the window greenhouse. Now this proved to be pretty tricky. We really wanted to paint this with an oil-based paint for longevity's sake, but it turns out there's some sort of paint shortage and getting enough oil-based paint took lots of calls and multiple trips to different stores. We were able to nail down the, the right amount of paint in this black. And as you can see, Noah is using a sprayer to apply the paint to the greenhouse frame. Um, that sprayer we've had for a really long time. Jeremiah used it on a job that he did many years ago, and we've definitely got our use out of it. But the thing is with putting the windows in the frame is it, we have to paint the frame, put the windows in, and then paint the frames of the windows. And this is fairly tedious to do, but once it's done, it's definitely going to be worth it. It's gonna last a long time to have it done this way. And this way we're not gonna be sitting in the greenhouse and noticing that there's a big spot that was missed or anything like that. Oh guys, this is gonna be one of those videos that just takes a few sessions to, to get it out and make it. <laughs> So it's night now, it's dark, my camera died earlier. And now you've seen that my greenhouse is black. So I wanna tell you a little bit about that. Um, I'm, I'm very, very excited about this window greenhouse. It is, it's something that I've kinda of had in my heart and I've had this vision for it for a little while now. And um, so let's, let's go back. Um, oh, dinner's done. <laughs> So 
sweet Maya actually cooked that. It's dirty rice and I'm so excited about it. I want to tell you the story about this this greenhouse and the design of it. Um, and I'm, I'll probably tell this again at some point so because I'm very excited about it. So I guess it sort of started a few years ago when our friend that we met through YouTube who was a viewer and then turns out we had some mutual friends in the world even though she lived in California we were from Arkansas her name's Rachel she made us this beautiful mosaic glass tabletop and it was this really beautiful design and you guys are gonna see it very soon and I just had this like desire to do something extraordinary with it. I was like, oh, you know, it's really pretty. And we had talked about putting the pavilion in the old uh, garden, but I wanted it to be kind of like a centerpiece. I even considered putting it in my house, but we decided because Maya had built our dining room table that we weren't going to do that. And I had this idea that it would be really cool for it to be a potting bench in the middle of a greenhouse. Now, of course, at that point um, that we got this table, we knew that we were going to be moving and it was in our hearts to move to South Carolina. And so I had this in my mind that we were going to make a greenhouse that shape could hold this table. Then move fast forward to last year when we were getting ready to move and I was really grieving my last garden. I was grieving leaving this garden and I had planted a bunch of things like even the year before that hadn't bloomed. And as I was leaving, like these sunflowers that were supposed to be red all bloomed and they were like so deeply red that they looked black. And these black hollyhocks that I had planted, I couldn't even remember what color they were. They came up and just absolutely wooed me. And so I went down the wormhole of black flowers and the whole goth garden flowers thing. I've never considered myself like goth a day in my life. I've always been super like, bright bubbly like colorful is what I'm drawn to but something about like the moodiness and the drama of black flowers just like strikes me in a deep place and uh that's that's what happened last year and it was just so profound to me that as I was grieving leaving my garden that my garden was just draped in these black flowers that kind of led me down to buying black irises and planting them here when we moved here and when I was in Ohio, I told y'all it was a long story. This greenhouse got a story behind it. I was in Ohio in the fall visiting my friend Matthew, and we decided, since Ohio is such a historic place, to kind of get on and look for some stained glass because I knew I wanted stained glass to go in my greenhouse to go with my glass mosaic table, potting bench in the middle. And we found this incredible piece and went and picked it up and it has a black iris in it. It just felt so perfect for me. So we actually designed this greenhouse around the table and this piece of stained glass. And I had a very specific image that I wanted for it and I really wanted all of the colorful glass that I'm incorporating to pop, hence the black. I, I have the image very clearly in my head. I cannot wait for you guys to be able to see it. But I'm definitely picturing this kind of moody, but just slightly rustic looking structure that is really gonna be the main focal point in the garden belt. And I, I wanted it to be such a way that it is the main focal point with the red barn behind it. Of course, our house is gonna be up there. And everything that we're planning right now is like five year plan because when we found this farm, before we ever built a single fence, before we built anything, the only thing we had done is plant that willow tree up by the pond. We got the aerial shot of this pond and we laid out everything and so that way we weren't going to be building something three years from now and going oh man I wish that wasn't there now that will probably happen even still the best laid plans right you know like there's probably some of that's going to happen but to the best of our ability we anticipated change and anticipated different things and laid this farm out and considered how things were going to complement each other so I think this greenhouse is going to be a really special piece of it and I'm so excited that I get to share the process with you guys. It's taking a little longer than we had initially anticipated, but such is life. I'm trying to be chill about it. Even though I do feel a little bit delayed, I know that it'll be okay. And I'm going to have this beautiful greenhouse for season after season. And I know you and I are going to have lots of great chats in it. <laughs> So that's it. That's the story told here at my kitchen counter after dark. Now it's time for me to serve up this delicious dinner. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. 
and yesterday. And I bless you until next time.